Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology activists uh, for here for a leap forward in medicine. So the doctor of the future, what should that doctor look like? And actually what kind of healthcare system should that doctor practice in? You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. There's a lot of community happening tonight. I want to say welcome uh, to all of the communities that are watching at home. This ecosystem that has been set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network that we are looking to develop, and it all revolves around you. That doctor of the future is to become the doctor of today. There's an exponential potential to the future of medicine because it can be seen by a billion people at no extra cost. That's the beauty of the internet. Welcome to the International Functional Forum, live from London. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first international functional forum since the summer break. Welcome to everyone here at the Royal Society of Medicine in London. Welcome to everyone who's watching online, either live on YouTube or on the recording afterwards. The theme for this evening is innovative practice. The format is very similar to what we always have here at our international forum, which is three speakers followed by a panel discussion. And I am incredibly excited about the topics and the speakers we've got speaking this evening. First thing I need to remind everyone of is that there are a host of meetups going on around the UK, around Europe, around Africa, and around the United States. In fact, all over the world, we've got 500 registered meetups. And the idea of these forums, really, is whether you're going to watch them live as they're happening, either in the UK or in America, the idea is that you can get together in your local communities and get healthcare professionals together, friends and family, invite your local doctor, and the idea is you watch these together. There's plenty on the internet already on the YouTube Function Forum websites where you can actually watch previous ones. And it's an incredible way. So if you're interested in setting up a forum in your community, in your town, in your village, go to meetup.functionalforum and uh, you'll get a lot of resources to help you do just that. Regarding the panel discussion this evening, which is how we're going to conclude things, you can ask questions. Uh, I will be taking live questions here in London, but you can also ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag functional forum. I'll be checking that throughout the evening, and uh, I'll be putting the sort of uh, most interesting and apt questions to the panel. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker for this evening. It's someone who is an NHS clinical entrepreneur. She has founded the company Medics Footprints, which I'm a huge fan of what that, um, what that organization stands for. She's a consultant occupational health physician, and I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Abena Jones. Inviting me, Rangan, um, and you know the rest of the Functional Forum crew. I just need to correct you. I'm not a consultant, occupational health physician. Uh, just in case anyone comes back and bites my ass for that, um, I'm still a registrar. So um, and. At the moment, I'm on a career break. So I just want to ask before I start, how many of you here are doctors? OK, brilliant. And how many of you um, would deemed to see yourself as kind of um, actively within an alternative career. Awesome. So um, for the purpose of this uh, talk, what is alternative careers and what is innovative careers? So uh, an alternative career, from my perspective, is a career that is um, off the beaten path, non-prescribed and created by the individual. Um, so in reality, alternative careers aren't anything new. I mean, we've been innovating 
as uh, practitioners and as doctors since the beginning of time. But the only thing that has changed, uh, especially quite recently, is that doctors have been looking for other alternatives because they've been pushed from their, their current healthcare settings. They're, they're no longer happy, they're disenfranchised, and they realize that actually there's a wider world beyond the conventional pathways. Um, and so this is exactly where I start. So you're probably wondering who am I and how did I get here? So I'll kind of run through my backstory. Um, so I, I, I was born in London, so London girl born and bred. I went to Nottingham Medical School, um, just about got in, so I, could, I thought I was an imposter for most of my five years. I was like, what was I really doing here? I passed my exams, and then came back to London, did my foundation years, and then I thought, you know, I was getting somewhat frustrated because even though I enjoyed my clinical practice, I did feel a bit more of an administrator than I'd like. Um, there was a lot of tick boxes, there were a lot of things that I needed to get done, and it was just, you know, it just really got to me. So I, I basically applied to work in South Africa, um, which was a bit random because I'd never been there, no ties whatsoever. And um, I, I then got the fear and then applied for core surgical training and actually did that instead because um, all, my, all my peers were doing it. So it just seemed to be the right thing to do, to just stay on that track, I'll get there eventually. Um, and then after my core surgical training, I was like, I definitely need a break now. It was actually affecting my mental health at that stage. Um, so I went out to South Africa and had the, the best professional years of my life hands down. Why? Because um, it was a completely different um, healthcare system. I had a lot more autonomy, flexibility, I felt valued. And most importantly, I had what I would call a really decent work-life balance. I actually worked longer hours, um, you know, 72 hours on call, pretty much the senior in most situations. But the balance was, you know, I had a great life. I was able to go hiking, traveling across South Africa. If any of you have been to South Africa, it's an absolutely stunning country absolutely stunning um, and, and really enjoyed myself and then decided, you know, I felt guilty again for leaving the NHS and I have to go back, I have to go back and finish my training. So I got back um, and uh, ended up here. <laughs> so th this is my life before, this is the life that I left, um, enjoying myself and, you know, really developing my personal professional skills and then ended up here. So who knows where this is? Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Hull. Hull, not quite, not quite. Uh, you, you're from uh, South Manchester. Where is this? <laughs> so, so for anyone who knows, so it's it, it's Blackburn. So Blackburn is is north of Manchester, just like half half an hour north of Manchester. As I realised when I got the job, and I was like, where the hell is Blackburn? Um, so. This is where I chose to spend another year of my life without really having any ties up north. Um, and it was at this moment that I decided, actually, I can't be moving across the country for the job. I need to do something else outside of my clinical practice. I really need something else to do. Um, so I, I did. I kind of woke up one day and spoke to um, my friend from school and said, let's just start a business. Completely naively, no experience in starting a business. And initially, we did do an overseas recruitment business, but that in itself opened up plenty more of opportunities for me. So we started Medic Footprints, um, which blossomed into an alternative careers and wellbeing forum for doctors. Um, how? Because I, I used Medic Footprints to then meet other people that were doing other things within medicine, outside of medicine. It really opened up my, my, kind of my perspective on, on life and opportunities, and then just ended up getting involved in all of this other stuff. Um, which I just threw myself into. And, you know, I was amazed because I'd spent most of my career thus far really pigeonholing myself and only knowing, only knowing clinical medicine. But then in my exploration of kind of running a business, which is kind of using, like, having to wear lots of different hats, you really kind of open yourself up to a whole range of different opportunities. Um, and the reason why I went into alternative careers was because at that time, a lot of my colleagues were looking to do other things, um, but not really knowing where to start because in medicine, it's very much a prescribed pathway um, and you kind of know where you're going on this kind of escalator, um, which takes like 15 years for some people. Um, and they didn't really know what to do if you're not doing that. There wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't ever advertised and we didn't really get that exposure. And if you, if the only new medicine, that, that's all you could really do. Um, and 
the consequences of that. So I kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, before I went to South Africa, I was developing kind of mental health issues and I was crying every day for like, I couldn't, I didn't know why. Um, but this is not unusual. And doctors really get into this situation when they um, experience any of these things. And the issue with that is that people that do leave it too late, that has an impact on the quality of care that they deliver. And this is why it's such a significant problem, especially now. Um, so I, I, as an occupational medicine doctor, so that, it, that's basically the specialty that deals with work and health, um, I see a lot of doctors kind of just pre or at crisis point. Um, again, not unusual, about one in four doctors do experience mental health issues at some point in their career. Um, and our, our kind of mental health um, Sorry, uh, yeah, we have mental health disorders. It usually is higher than the average population. And some of the reasons that are thought due to that is, is um, the fact that we don't, we don't report. We, we self-manage, corridor consultations, um, you name it. You know, you know, we're doctors, we have the skills, but has anyone heard of the doctor paradox? Yeah, what, what's a doctor paradox? You're, you're kind of, what's a doctor paradox? Sorry? It, sorry, physician. Yeah, so so. That is a very good description, and it, we, we do ha tend to have a lack of insight into how unwell we are until someone points it out. And even then, it's like, actually, you're in denial for a period of time until something disastrous happens to you. I'm sure that's happened to some of us. It's even happened to me. And, then, and, and even as an occupational health physician who does that every day, I'm still vulnerable to that, even more so vulnerable in many ways. Um, and, you know, despite all that, you know, the GMC does say that we are obliged to be looking after ourselves within the workplace and we have to self-report if there are any concerns. Um, but then how can we do that? Most of the time, we, we don't even know whether we've got any, any ongoing issues. And that, you know, in the past, there used to be a lot of taboo around this subject. This is definitely improving over time, but still an issue because we were never really um, advised on how to deal with the hazards at work, which is the, the mental and physical and emotional hazards of actually being a doctor. Um, and uh, we're always advised to put patients first, right? Patients first. So, so this is a huge issue, and that is why well-being is in the core of what we do at Medic Footprints. Um, so just moving on to alternative careers. Um, so most people, when they, they say, oh, you know, what can I do as a doctor outside of conventional medicine? They then Google and expect to have a list of things. Um, well, there is a list of things, but, you know, I say, you know, don't, don't Google this. It really depends on you as an individual. It really depends on what are your passions, what are your priority in life. Everything is different. There is no set pathway, but make sure that you have your well-being sorted out first. Don't jump into anything that, that you know, if you, you've got an ongoing, ongoing stresses, ongoing mental health or physical issues, make sure you sort that out first. And then consider your, your clinical and non-clinical skills and the transferable skills. Um, and then learn how to articulate that. So earlier on, like we were talking in the cafe about, doc well, about how doctors um, differ from, you know, across the pond to here. And um, so in America, doctors are very good at kind of branding themselves, marketing themselves, actually putting themselves forward. Here in the UK, we, don't, we just don't have that culture really. So if you are a doctor trying to get out there and get outside of the box, it can be a struggle initially because you don't really know how to communicate anything beyond your audits and your publications. Um, <laughs> you're laughing, but it's so true, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, and actually how to, how to appear confident and say, actually, I am a doctor, I have done this, I have these skills, and this is why it's relevant to my next pathway, to, to whatever I'm going to. So we find that, how many of you are GPs in the room? Awesome. So you are in an absolutely fantastic position to diversify. Um, you are, you, you've got like three years of training, and then you're out there in the big wide world. And by nature, your culture means that you are able to do a whole variety of different things, whether you're going to diversify or develop a portfolio career. Um, but there are lots of doctors from other specialties who are also able to do this now. Um, so, I mean, this is a list of some of the things um, that you can potentially do. Um, but again, the list is limitless. So just, just remember, there is no list. 
um, and it is really diverse. And you know, you've got a car designer there. And what you're saying, oh, fer fertilizer something. <laughs> it really depends on what your interests are and it is limitless. Um, so, because I mean, Functional Thought Forum is about wellness. I mean, wellness is huge now, and there are so many opportunities within it. And you know, I'm really excited to see medics, as well as other healthcare professionals, but medics can potentially be at the forefront of this as well. And, and you know, working with you know allied health professionals in a really truly multi-professional, exciting environment. Um, so, I mean, as I said, I'm an occupational medicine doctor. And um, there are a whole range of other things that you can potentially do. And um, just as a doctor, because this is another thing that we tend to do, common mistakes, is we tend to kind of jump into another qualification before we start this. But I would say just get involved and, you know, meet people and you can really create something that's special. Um, tips to get you started. So firstly, have a relevant backstory, so my, you've heard my backstory. But the reason why it's really important is because you know that your pathway is the right one for you when you've been telling it several times and you realize how passionate you are about it and people actually buy into you. So it's about the human to human interaction behind that story. Um, expand your networks, I talked about that a lot. So, you know, doctors, we're not very good at kind of just networking and actually meeting people. Um, but it's so important, it's so important to do that because that is what opens up the opportunities that you need. Um, do things for free. So I was talking to Rupi Ajila, um, who is the, what was it, what's his name, is the medic? Doctor's Kitchen. That's it, Doctor's Kitchen, you're the food medic, sorry. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And, and basically, he, he was like, because actually he was a, he, he'd been to the Medic Footprints event before he actually started up Doctor's Kitchen. And uh, one of the things he said, he was like, just do everything for free. Just say yes. Just say yes. You know, go everywhere, do everything, and things will eventually come to you. Those opportunities will come. Um, keep an open mindset. So one of the things I would say, and I've noticed even from myself, is that when I started on this journey, opportunities that were already there, I didn't see. But once I started opening up my mindset and meeting new people, all of these opportunities started flooding in. And I could see things that were already there, but I, you know, I wasn't able to kind of, I don't know, understand or actually pursue because I didn't see it as an opportunity. And you'll understand what I mean when you actually go on this journey. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of doctors find it difficult to just jump off and start something new, which you don't have to do. A lot of people are doing it as a portfolio career or on the side. I mean, I was... I, I started Medic Footprints when I was still working uh, full time and for the last three, three years I've been doing it full time whilst I'm training and I would not recommend that. <laughs> so at some point you really have to decide which you're going to focus on or do a bit of both if, if um, your employer does support that. And don't use money as a, a kind of a goal of, of what or an idea of, of or guide as what your next career should be because I mean money is very important but should not be the number one important thing because you will find yourself trapped. And I find a lot of doctors do get trapped. I mean, we, go, we talk about management consultancy and most doctors won't know what the hell management consultancy is, but we'll jump into it because it seems to be the thing to do and appears to be quite lucrative. Um, but it may not work for them at all. And finally, just make sure you're designing a career that you love. And you know you love it because you don't see it as a job. It's like a, it's like a hobby and you live it, you breathe it. And, it, and you are supposed to love your job. I, I know it sounds funny, but you are supposed to love your job. And we've had some doctors that say, but you're not supposed to enjoy your job, are you? It's a job. No, no. Um, so finally, um, so just to tell you a little bit more about Medic Footprints. So as I mentioned, we're an organization that supports doctors in career transition and well-being. So we run networking events. We run an annual conference. Um, the next one is at the end of October. And this is an inspiring event to get doctors together networking, developing new skills such as coding. Um, we've got I am Panja talking about lifestyle medicine, nutrition. I really want to use more, more of the things that I've learned on my own personal journey in, in functional medicine. I'm, I'm a very early, early stage person and really share that with the wider world of medics out there. So we found, I was talking to some medical students um, at Nottingham University on on Saturday that they, they are setting up their own kind of lifestyle medicine group and I, and I find that really, really fascinating. And the problem is it's not as instilled in, in like um, doctors that have been practicing for numerous years because they're used to, to pharma, they're used to the nice guidelines and, and there's nothing wrong with nice guidelines, but why not 
add a bit of extra. Why don't you have a look at your lifestyle as a whole? And the problem is we don't have that time. Most people just don't have that time. But in occupational medicine, we have an hour, which is awesome. So uh, yeah, so if, if that's something that you're interested in, just um, please chat to me afterwards. And my final question, because um, um, I, so I have been, my, my friend also, she, she went on the functional medicine course, which she thought was awesome last year, or this year, I should say, and um, I suffer from chronic eczema. And uh, so I've been doing the elimination diet, uh, which was a challenge, but uh, it has transformed my life in many ways. I know it's an early stage, but I wonder whether we can use any of these functional medicine principles to address the well-being issue for doctors. So this is the question that I'm leaving you as the audience with. Thank you very much. <laughs> Abena, thank you. I think that was just a fabulous talk. Um, I think medic footprints and the concepts you spoke about, I don't think have ever been more necessary than they are now. Um, we've got a healthcare crisis. There's no question about that. And uh, there's many reasons for that. Um, we talk about doctors or healthcare professionals not having enough time with their patients, and that's clearly, clearly a big issue. But specifically talking about medical doctors, I would argue that one of the reasons that satisfaction is at its lowest point that I can remember in over 16 years of practicing medicine, because I think we feel frustrated because a lot of the time we have not been given the tools that are gonna get our patients better. And it's a pretty hard realization to come to as a doctor when you figure out that all your training, fantastic though it is, has, um, is good for a particular subset of your patients. And we're seeing more and more people who we can't get better with that framework. And I think this is absolutely key. For me, when I went on my journey of learning functional medicine and I was because unfortunately for me, I had family reasons that, that sort of motivated me to go and travel halfway across the world to find out how I could fix a member of my family. But I remember calling my wife from one of those conferences and I said to her, and I have not thought about this for a while, but it's something in your talk made me think of this. And I said to her, at the very least, I'm gonna figure out, I'm already learning how to make myself healthier and make my family healthier. And that's all I get out of this it will be worth it. And, you know, functional medicine for me, I've never felt this good. I feel amazing. Um, the way I live my life is something that I then transfer into the way I, I sort of talk to my patients. And I think it's, it, it's a really nice marriage, actually, in terms of how that works. So I think that's a very, very important question. And actually, the Royal College of GPs contacted me a few days ago to see if I could come and talk to their doctors about well-being for GPs, because it's a big issue. You put some pretty alarming statistics there about mental health problems for doctors. And I think if we learnt more, either in our training or in our postgraduate training, how we can look after ourselves better, the natural extension of that is we're going to be able to look after our patients better. And um, yeah, I think, unfortunately, most of the people I see who are embracing this have had a personal reason to do it, and, and I think that's important, but it would be, wouldn't it be great if actually not everyone needed a personal reason to embrace the principles that we're talking about, so functional medicine or lifestyle medicine, you know, there's so many terms about there, but frankly, it's what I call good medicine. This is freezing, but uh, I can keep going, Mike, can you have a look at that whilst? So, it's working. So I've been on a bit of a journey in my own career for the past few years, and the actual turning point, is something I, this is not something I've shared that much actually in public, but nearly five years ago my dad died, and that had a significant influence on me because I had moved back to live near my mum and dad to help care for my dad who was um, on dialysis for 15 years and had lupus and chronic kidney disease. And after he died, I did a lot of reflection in my own life about what I wanted. And since I decided to follow my heart and actually do what I love, I am now in the process of designing a career that I love. Because over the last five years, I've fallen in love with medicine again. 
I love seeing patients. I find it's the most exciting thing about what I do, about my profession. Uh, and a lot of doctors don't feel that way anymore, unfortunately. I've been very lucky that I've had the opportunity to do a couple of series on BBC One, and the last one called Doctor in the House aired just before the summer. James asked me to talk about a couple of them just to give a few clinical tips in terms um, of, of the forum tonight. And uh, for those of you who have not seen it, this was a show where I had uh, a family from sort of the Northampton area. There was a strong history of diabetes, type 2 diabetes in the family, uh, which the mum, uh, sort of Doreen, had. But her daughter, Laverne, was 37. She had a whole host of problems, most of which were driven, well, all of which were driven by her lifestyle. But interestingly enough, something I'm very passionate about is preventive medicine. And we do not practice preventive medicine in the NHS. If you think we do, I think we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves because what we call preventive medicine is when you've got a high blood pressure, we'll bring your blood pressure down. By the time you've got high blood pressure, your body has been malfunctioning on some level for very many years. So that is still very, very late, I would argue. So what was interesting about Laverne is that I identified not that she had type 2 diabetes, not that she had pre-diabetes, but that her fasting insulin levels and her two-hour postprandial fasting insulin level, uh, so her two-hour insulin levels were high. So she was on the road to getting it. So it was a really beautiful way of actually engaging her in making lifestyle change that, frankly, she didn't think was necessary because she didn't have a diagnosis. I engaged a friend of mine, Daryl, who's got a lot of training in nutrition because I needed to find um, something that was culturally relevant for this family in terms of the food that they were going to eat. So it's all very well me coming in and trying to give the advice that I would give or what I would eat. But if that doesn't translate to that patient, it doesn't really matter. So we had some really, really great results in that. And the, the, other, the other story which James has touched on, which asked me to talk about is... Um, the, the very first episode of the new series, which actually got a lot of controversy. And I think the controversy in that is very apt to the next presentation, well, the, the final presentation today. And it was a lady who had excruciating headaches. And for those of you who saw it, it was, it was, you know, was heart-wrenching watching her, sitting next to her in her house, watching her scream in agony with her kids trying to comfort her. And it's probably one of the most uncomfortable places I've ever been in as a doctor. Because in, your, in our consultation room, we'll hear about the story, right? But when you're in someone's house without that security around you, you are seeing it firsthand and you are actually, you know, you're feeling pretty helpless. It's not like someone having an MI that you're trained to know what to do. This wasn't an acute problem. This was something that had been going on for 15 years and she was getting 90 a week. So... The upshot is we managed to get them down, and I say we, Mike here was a huge help to me throughout this whole process, um, from 90 down to two a week, something that neurologists over 15 years had not managed to do. So the question is, it's not that I'm better than those neurologists, and it's not actually that I had more time with them than their neurologists, because I examined how long she had with those neurologists. It's about a fundamentally different approach, and it's about an understanding of what true evidence-based medicine is. I won't elaborate too much on that, because I know John's going to cover some of that a bit later. But essentially, with a combination of dietary change, meditation, appropriate supplementation to, to, to do specific things to her biochemistry, and by getting musculoskeletal therapists involved to help her from a structural component, we managed to make her life bearable again. I'm super proud of it. The critique leveled at me was, where's the evidence for it? Well, the evidence says there's a lady who had excruciating headaches for 15 years and she didn't have them anymore. <laughs> That's the only evidence I need, actually, as a doctor, after seeing patients for 16 years, because the reality is she had tried all the evidence-based treatment. She'd been down to all the specialist centers. And actually, when I spoke to one of the top neurologists in the country about this, he was 100% behind my plan. He said, Ronga, this is real life. Okay? She doesn't, she's, our treatments aren't working. What are you going to do? And everything I did with her, worst case scenario, she was no better, completely safe. 
So I'm very passionate that the way we, we are, I feel as a profession, are doing our patients a slight disservice in how we interpret evidence-based medicine. As I say, John is going to go into that a little bit later. Just a reminder that you can ask questions to me on uh, Twitter with the hashtag functional forum. And uh, I am checking that throughout the evening. I'm not actually ignoring the lecturers. I'm actually checking the Twitter feeds to formulate questions for later. And anyone watching live on YouTube, please, please use that as well. So it's time for the second speaker of the evening. She is a functional medicine practitioner. She's a nutritional therapist, and she's been running her own company, Heartwell Therapy, for many years. She's a corporate health coach, and she's now very much involved in practitioner training. And it's, um, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. She started off as a neuroscientist, um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about her journey of taking it from the bench to the bedside. It's Dr. Elizabeth Phillips. <laughs> So as Rongan said, I'm going to be taking you through a little bit about my journey now as well, which I think is you know, hopefully going to give you a little bit of insight. Maybe you're here looking at alternative careers, maybe you're here just to get some ideas as to how to integrate functional medicine into your practice. So I want to start, first of all, by maybe covering in a little bit more detail what Rongan was talking about, about the sort of health crisis within the country, and obviously how this is affecting us as practitioners, and also, of course, patients, the, the end users, and some of the issues that are, are coming about that, and that we're facing. So, okay, is that working now? Yep, wonderful, that's great. So, of course, you know, I'm not here to knock medicine in any way. I spent many years in medical research, and we know that in the last few decades there have been many very rapid advancements in medical uh, health and uh, some very positive health benefits. But what we also know is that the bear moth that is the NHS, the uh, medical research that's going on, is up against an awful lot of challenges because there is a health crisis, a national health crisis. We've got this really rapid advancement of chronic disease. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the neurological side, and that will become very obvious as I move through my own career history. And of course, the development of medicine as well is facing, you know, a lot of challenges. And really, you know, there are, are three sort of kind of over, you know, arching areas that, that, that I see. There's certainly over division. You know, I think we can all sort of feel that, uh, you know, in whatever branch of, of clinical work that we're in. And I certainly know that I have a lot of clients coming to see me that have maybe been passed from pillar to post because, you know, their systems, individual systems have been looked at, you know, rather than looking at the person maybe as a whole. And I know, as Rongan was saying, with his work, that he's been doing there as well. We've got over-specialisation, and I'm going to show that very much in my own career pathway as how I went further and further or pulled myself further and further away from what I love, which is working with people, and went very much into the, the sort of micro arena of, uh, of neuroscience. And we've also got fragmentation, and I think this comes about maybe as part of the first two when we've got the over-division, we've got the over-specialisation. And unfortunately, there's the potential then to maybe lose some really key parts, or not maybe lose, but you know, maybe we're just not joining all the dots that we should be. And I think you know, it really should be axiomatic that you know, medical students today are given the skills you know, in order to you know, face, you know, know what they're going to face in the clinic. And you know, not just medical students, but you know, health practitioners as well. But all too often, you know, this is not happening. You know, we've got this rise in chronic disease. And so that we're finding that people just aren't equipped. And as Abena was saying, you know, this is then really much impacting on our own personal health as well. And I'm just going to run through, I've sort of mentioned chronic disease just as an umbrella term, but I want to focus just very briefly at the moment on the sort of neurological side. And as I said, that will become clear as I move through my own career history, why I'm focusing on this area in particular. But just a few stats that are, are being pulled up from uh, the Dementia Statistics Organisation. And at the moment, there are around about 850,000 people in the UK that are diagnosed with dementia. But actually, this is going to be dramatically increasing. They reckon forecast to over 2 million people with dementia in the UK by 2050. This really is one of the major chronic diseases that's kicking in. 
We also know that there has been this huge rise over the last few years, and of course, one could argue that that's going to be down to uh, you know better detection, you know better medical detection, better research. But equally, you know there is definitely something happening within the world. You know we've got how people are living, their lifestyles, what they're exposed to, what they're eating, what they're thinking, the stresses that they're uh, you know under within their environment. All of this is impacting on all areas of our health. This particular statistic really got me when I was actually uh, researching and, and looking at, uh, at what I was going to say about this particular area for, for this particular presentation. And I look at all of my friends and my family that are having children this year, and it's now one in three children that are born this year will develop dementia. And of course, this is coming in earlier and earlier as well. This is not now still an old person's disease. You know, we're seeing dementia being diagnosed at far younger years as well. And I think, you know, this is where I get really passionate about. And again, it's very important to, to follow your heart and to follow, you know, what you do love. And, you know, the fact that dementia is the only condition in the top 10 causes of death that currently, and this is within the medical circles, are believed not to have a treatment to prevent, cure or slow progression. However, as I move through my career evolution, um, I'm going to be obviously talking through functional medicine and the way that actually there is a lot now that we can be doing um, to really be working in this arena. But this is where I was. Maybe this is where you are right now. Maybe it's where you've been and you've come through this stage and you are now you know, sort of feeling a little bit more confident in maybe the, the pathway that you're going to be choosing. But you know, this really you know, does happen to all of us. And I think you know, when we're very caring, very empathetic, very driven people, um, you know, we can find that we get to a bit of a crossroads. And this you know, so often extends from maybe the training that we've had, as again, as Rong and Abena were saying, you know, we're not given the skills necessarily to actually get out there and to, to really make the difference to you know self-empower people to better health but also get the benefits for ourselves as well you know not only looking after our own health but that really important professional satisfaction that we get with a better patient practitioner therapeutic relationship as well so let's start then I'm going to take you through my career history now and how I ended up as a functional medicine practitioner moving away from uh, uh, being and well not moving away but maybe developing um, my, my neuroscience area so the observant amongst you will see 1978 you're probably thinking well she was very young thank you very much you know I was um, and you might be thinking well actually there's a picture of a rattle there so it's obvious that she was very young in 1978 but actually what that image is depicting is a, a detective's magnifying glass because even at the tender age of three years old, which I was in 1978, it was very apparent to my family, who were medics, veterinary surgeons, scientists, that I was going to be going into the, uh, into the medical world or the healthcare world at some point. Because I love nothing better, better at three years old to drink large volumes of Ribena, and that for our American and our foreign friends is a blackcurrant juice that you have as children. And I would rush up the stairs having drunk very large volumes of this and I would find the spare bed which had the springs in the mattress and the springs in the bed, you know, none of, none of that memory foam stuff anymore, you know, proper bed. And I would bounce really vigorously because then I could hear all of the liquid sloshing around in my stomach. And I thought that was so cool. Why did that happen? How did that happen? And, you know, it really is a very vivid childhood memory of mine. I was obviously classed as quite a strange child at times but it's something that I really did you know it really did fascinate me the human body how does it work and you know this stuck with me as I moved through you know why is the body aging you know why why are my parents complaining about old you know getting stiff joints why are my grandparents getting older all of this you know really did fascinate me so it moved me through my GCSEs and A-levels and actually into biomedical science, though interestingly I did get a place uh, at St. Bart's to study medicine, but in the summer of when I was due to start, I just thought, you know what, I'm not quite sure I'm ready for this. You know, it actually I felt very overwhelmed by the thought of going into medicine at that stage. So I decided at the age of 18, much to the horror of my parents as we discussed this one dinner time, that I was going to step away from studying medicine straight away and I was going to move uh, more into the research and uh, science. So I studied biomedical science at King's College in London, had a wonderful time, and in that sort of umbrella degree in all of the uh, well, biomedical sciences, clues in the name, um, I found neuroscience and the wonderful Professor Webster that really inspired me, and you know, this I really felt I'd found at least my, my human health area of, of real interest. And if you ever want to feel this big in the world, and if you ever want to feel like you're never going to know anything the more you study, study neuroscience or neurology, it really is absolutely fascinating. 
So I moved this through and I was really enjoying myself in the neuroscience area. I did a PhD at Oxford University at the Department of Pharmacology there where I was getting more and more into the human brain. You know, I had my own human brain um, from a, a, a very good scheme that King's College London had, um, but actually I was moving into parts of the human brain now. So it was getting very, very micro. And I was looking mainly at Alzheimer's disease. So it was very much about the pathways involved in Alzheimer's disease. And I could still kind of tell, you know, my my family, my friends, what I was doing, but actually I was getting right down into the glutamate receptor pathways. And this led me then on into my career as a lab leader at Merck Sharp and Dome, which is, was rather the neuroscience research center, um, which uh, was uh, funded and run by Merck and Co, though unfortunately has, uh, has now been closed down because there is no money in um, neuropharmacology uh, in terms of drug targets. targets. There's just too big a placebo effect um, for some of the, the drugs that, that, or the targets that we were looking at. But I had a really, really happy few years. You know, I was really enjoying myself, you know, running a team of 18 scientists, looking in absolute detail at what was going on in the brain. And, you know, it was something that, that was fascinating. And I thought you would be really fascinated to see you know, my research that I was doing. And this is how detailed it was. I wasn't just looking at the glutamate receptor family. I was looking at the NMDA or the N-methyl-D-aspartate family. And I wasn't just looking at the assembly of the entire pentameric ionic channel, so the five subunits. I was looking at just two of those subunits. And I wasn't just looking at the entire protein sequence of those subunits, two subunits. I was looking at the cassettes of amino acids within the N-terminus, I can see you're all fascinated, <laughs> of the NR1A and the NR2A subunit. So I'm now going to do a spoiler alert. If you don't want to know what happens, if you, you know, decide that on your way home this evening, if you decide that you know, after the presentation you want to rush out and start looking at some of the seminal work, which I presented around the world at various international meetings on these glutamate receptors, then block your ears now. I will wave my hand when I'm done. I see a few people. That's really good. So the spoiler alert is, does the NR1A subunit assemble with the NR2A subunit to form this functioning NMDA receptor? Yes, it does. <laughs> And that, my friends, was six years of my life. Now, <laughs> what can I say? I was a strange child. Um, so, you know, it's something that I am really proud of. Don't get me wrong. You know, this is seminal research. This research is still being carried on. You know, it's still being developed. There were various PhD students after myself. I was working uh, with teams looking at this. It's really important to understand what is happening in the brain. You know, understanding these glutamate receptor pathways. You know, these are really key. But actually, it wasn't doing what I love. You know, it really wasn't. And it was something that, you know, left me still confounded. You know, how can I actually make a difference? How can I make an intervention? You know, it's, it's all very well if I know which amino acids in the N-terminus of the NR1A subunit are a problem. But that doesn't help me help directly somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So this got me thinking. And actually, my hand was forced in terms of my career change. I, I wasn't given the luxury of some time to think about it particularly and develop my ideas because I suffered from burnout. You know, the, there was no doubt that the career that I'd chosen, I was working for an American company and I was traveling to the States an awful lot. I was working in a very high pressured environment. It actually led me to burnout. And so my hand was forced and one might say it was a very bleak time and it was a very difficult time because it was a very fast, very debilitating illness. And I had to totally reconsider uh, what my whole lifestyle, not just my career. And I consulted medical professionals, some very eminent medical professionals at various clinics. I've consulted a lot of research neuroscientists and a, and a lot of uh, very eminent professors in the area, but nobody could help me. Nobody could, you know, really give me the answers maybe that I was looking for, at least some clues, you know, of the sorts of things to look at. So as I said, you know, this might seem like a really bleak time. You know, this might have been a time that, you know, I, I you know, could have given up and changed totally and, and done something totally different. But what did I do? Well, of course, I did what I know how, and I researched the heck out of what was going on in me and how could I make a difference. And, you know, this didn't involve Ribena and jumping on beds, by the way, because jumping on beds when you have chronic fatigue syndrome is not something that's, that you're capable of. So I found a much more elegant solution, and that was nutritional medicine. And it's something that really transformed my life, but then also has now enabled me to go on and really help empower others. And it's the self-empowerment of other people um, that, that I'm really proud of. 
So I did a nutritional medicine degree. Uh, you know, it was still in keeping with, with what uh, my background is, but to move very much more into the macro area, back out into the whole human body, which was quite a relief. And uh, did a nutritional medicine degree and now run my own clinic, Heartwell Nutrition, and uh, also do, uh, as you say, the practitioner education and the coaching as a part of that. And all that has organically grown uh, over time, you know, taking a lot of the advice that Avena had said, you know, in terms of making sure that, uh, you know, you, you get yourself out there, you network, and uh, you never know, you know, what might come from that. And within the nutritional medicine, um, I found functional medicine. You know, I've been practicing for a number of years now. And actually, you know, the functional medicine approach, you know, just makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense to my researcher's mind, but it makes perfect sense to a health mind. And just a quick show of hands, who here has done the AFMCP training? We've got a few. Excellent. Okay. Well, there's still a lot more in this room. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's, you know, what I can say is I know I've put this image up here, which, you know, might seem a little bit, you know, overpowering, uh, you know, a bit too much information on one slide, especially if you're new to the functional medicine area. But functional medicine is very much systems based. And it's very much evidence-based. But the importance is, is that we're looking at the root causes of disease. And you know, we're taking the person as a whole, and we're working with the person. It demystifies disease, which I think is so important. The fear factor surrounding disease labels in itself can be you know, as huge, almost, as the actual effect of the disease. And again, you know, I speak from personal experience. When you're told that there's nothing that can be done, it's a really scary prospect. So functional medicine, as I say, it works, you know, looking at the root causes. This is why the, the um, IFM, the Institute of Functional Medicine, use this sort of tree diagram, um, looking at all of the systems as well. And it's a, a really very powerful tool and one that can be implemented, you know, throughout uh, you know, many different practices. This also then leads us on into P4 medicine as well, which is all part of the functional medicine um, arena. This was devised by uh, Leroy Hood, Hood um, back in the, sort of the early 2000s, around about 2003, who's a very eminent uh, scientist and also you know, very much a systems-based, you know, his, uh, his approach. And P4 medicine, you know, applies again, you know, it's, it's, it's all part of the functional medicine umbrella. Um, it stands for, well, it's, it's all about patient-centered care. So it stands for the personalized, it stands for the preventative, for predictive, and also for the, thank you, participatory. I knew I was going to forget one of the four. I do know those. The participatory. So in terms of timing tonight, um, I've got two references, um, which, you know, should be made available if you're interested, because in particular, the P4 medicine, you know, really can apply very greatly to geriatric medicine or, you know, in the arena of, of Alzheimer's disease as well. And really what I wanted to do tonight was just, you know, begin to maybe raise awareness, you know, or, or certainly, you know, encourage the awareness of functional medicine and the P4 medicine approach as something, you know, that can be incorporated as part of an alternative career. But of course, what you might be thinking is, hang on a minute, A, I don't really want to totally retrain. I don't have the time to do more degrees, or maybe that's not what I want to do. That's not going to suit my health. That's not going to suit me. Maybe you're thinking, how the hell do I fit all of this into one consultation? We don't have the hour. We've got 10 minutes. You know, this, this really you know, doesn't make sense. But it's about integration. So it's not just integrating what's happening within the patient and putting the patient first and working with them. It's integrating within a chronic care team as well. I don't work on my own. I don't do everything you know, within my practice, within the referrals. You know, I work with GPs. I certainly work with a lot of uh, structural biogenic, bioenergetic practitioners, you know, osteopaths, chiropractics, acupuncture as well has been a, a really big find. I've just teamed up with a holistic dentist. You know, the effects of mercury and, uh, you know, dentistry on human health, you know, is really, really huge. Again, you know, just go out and, and look at some of the, the research and, and evidence that's there. So it's about working as part of a team, you know, so it's, it's integrating yourself or, you know, becoming part of a chronic care team. So you're not alone. And I think that's really important because you can feel really isolated, especially if you're stepping outside of the box. I know I've had to do this with my family and, you know, a lot of my scientific friends they don't maybe understand or don't want to understand what functional medicine is my darling brother who I'm very close to who is a GP he's just finished his GP training so he's now practicing in the Oxford area we just have to not talk about functional medicine
person at the moment. But I'm assured by all the GPs that I've spoken to at AFMCP, and I'm sure you hear um, that his time will come, and soon he will be <laughs> soon he will be knocking on my door and wanting to know all about functional medicine. So you know, again, you know, it's about becoming part of a team, and you know, that is the support that you need as a professional, um, as well as really making a difference um, for for other people as well. So I'm just going to leave you um, with this slide. I know it, it kind of it made me laugh as well when I see it, but but then actually you know, there's, there's quite a serious side as well, which you know if we could just you know. Uh, think about it. But uh, what intrigued me actually was the date of this. 2003, this cartoon came out. And in 2003, when I was, you know, at the height of my micro Alzheimer's research, yeah, that's pretty much what it was. And that's no way to be, you know, either for the patient or for the practitioner delivering that sort of message, you know. That, and, and of course, you know, it can still happen today, where, you know, in the, in the neurological area. But, you know, really in terms of Alzheimer's disease, we've come an awful long way. And as I said, I'm proud of the research I've done. Done. Don't get me wrong, you know, that, that's been a, a really, you know, sort of excellent part of my career that I know I've really made a contribution. But what I do know now is that actually using functional medicine is what's really making the difference to, to every day, to people's lives and to the carers as well, you know, not just to, to the people that are, are maybe, you know, sort of actually have the, 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 the disease label. So I think, you know, it's really important that we remember that the functional medicine approach, you know, really gives opportunities to, to, to move this forward. And then I was going to take this slide out, but then I decided to put it back in again. And again, you know, it's something I like to remind myself, you know, that if I keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome, then I really must be getting quite mad. And it's a quote that Einstein said, see, a number of years ago. And, you know, it really does play true. If we want to make a difference, then we're going to have to take a little bit of risk. We're going to have to step outside of our comfort zone. But actually, the rewards when you do step outside of your comfort zone are absolutely huge. And there's a lot of excellent training, as so the Institute of Functional Medicine, there's a lot of CPD opportunities. We've got AFMCP coming up uh, next year now, October next year. So there's a lot that you know, we can all be doing to really you know, make sure that we get you know, both the satisfaction of helping patients, but also that we're looking after ourselves as practitioners as well. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to taking your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Super interesting, actually. Thank you for sharing your journey. Um, I think it's quite important for, you know, I, I saw on the show of hands before that a few people, you know, a, a small percentage, a small to medium, I'd say, percentage have, have actually done a functional medicine course. Um, and I think the term sometimes can be confusing to some people. So you, you mentioned your brother, who's just finished... Uh, GP training and I think what starts to get people thinking differently is when they see the frustrations of clinical practice and when you know the, the ceiling is of what we have been taught how that helps people and I think it's quite important to, for, for any doctors watching or any sort of watching on YouTube or doctors here is that it's not separate from what we've learnt Okay? It's just an extension. It's a, it's a framework. It's, it's a different framework. It's a different lens through which to look at your patients. So everything you've learned so far in your training and in your practice is absolutely still as valid when you're seeing patients. It's not as if you, you can't do that anymore and instead you, you've gone to the other side. No, you've just got a bigger toolbox to help your patients with. So it's not either or. And I think that's something that sometimes... Not everyone gets. It's just adding to your toolbox. You just got more, um, more ways to help your patient. Sometimes you won't use things from that toolbox. Sometimes you will. Um, but it, but really, it's about an approach. It's about a different approach because you can read blogs, you can read articles, but then you need some way of putting it all together to help the person in front of you, and that's what it does incredibly well. So. This event is put on by clinical education in the UK, but also the evolution of medicine, uh, which is primarily based in the US, but has penetration all over the world. And James, who, who is one of the co-founders of the evolution of medicine, he's very keen that people don't just hear good lectures or, you know, they go on courses and then they go back to their sort of normal lives. Because 
it's a real issue, and this is something Abina touched on before, in terms of how do you then go about utilising the skills that you may be learning in real life practice? Uh, I'm certainly speaking as a medical doctor, I know that we get very little training on business. Uh, we're very much ingrained in an NHS model, and the NHS is fantastic, um, but I don't think it trains us to, to think outside the box. And as you pointed out at the bar before and in your talk, I think medical doctors in the UK feel that the NHS is their only outlet in which to practice medicine. And it's just simply not the case. A lot of people are actually doing NHS work and private work and they're, they're having a bit of a portfolio career. So they're able to you know, do the 10 minute appointments uh, and, and serve the NHS, but also do the one hour appointments where they get to really enjoy practicing medicine uh, and really help their patients. So how do you do that? How do you learn how to do that? I mean, we've got, um, you know, later on on the panel, we've got Hazel Wallace, the food medic, who's clearly got a very uh, skillful sort of business and entrepreneurial brain to, to be able to, at such a young age, sort of develop uh, such a strong and powerful brand as you have done, Hazel. But I think many doctors don't have that and don't get exposed to that. And so I think it's worth having a look at what the evolution of medicine offers you. Someone in America has done their course, Lara, she calls the Practice Accelerator Program is a personal trainer for your entrepreneurial muscle. And I think that's quite nice, actually. So I'd encourage any of you who are thinking about, or you know, you, you've got that sort of excitement, yeah, I'd like to do a bit more, but I just don't know how to do it. I would encourage you to check out uh, goevomed.com slash brochure and you'll get a lot of tools which will help you. How do you start off a practice on the side? Maybe you want to stay in the NHS and do this on the side with minimum overheads. How can you use technology to help you? You know, they've been doing it for a few years. They've, got, they've been through multiple iterations. And, and I certainly wish I had access to this, you know, five or six years ago. Um, so it's just worth saying, if any of you are interested in, in, in sort of learning some of those skills, I think the courses on there, this online training course, is, is going to be very beneficial for you. Final reminder about the panel discussion later, please do ask any questions uh, on Twitter. For those of you here, you can ask it straight to me, but anyone watching on YouTube, please do use the hashtag functional forum, and I'll try and get through to those questions uh, later on during the panel discussion. So, it's the time for the final speaker of this evening, and it's... it's quite exciting for me to, to introduce the next speaker. It was someone I have looked up to for many years. I remember maybe 2005, 2006, reading some uh, articles in the mainstream press. I think it was in The Observer, from recollection, um, from this doctor, who has actually been practicing uh, using nutrition and lifestyle as his sort of first-line medical interventions uh, for a whole number of years. He has been a practicing medical doctor for over 27 years. That's a lot of clinical experience. Certainly beats my 16 years by, uh, by quite a lot. So, um, yeah, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, with some of his writings. He's written nine books. And um, yeah, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. John Briffer. Thank you very much. I'm um, feeling shorter than normal, but anyway. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, what I really want to talk about um, uh, in this uh, session is really the art and sort of science of medicine. I'll expand on that a bit later on, but I've also been asked to talk about how I sort of got out, escaped, if you like, uh, conventional medicine and got into uh, the sort of work that I, I do now. So I actually qualified around the corner here at UCL. And um, I had no interest in medicine, sort of therapeutics, really, because the idea of, you know, spending hours talking about sodium or potassium and tinkering with people's medication, not really getting them well, that's what I'd experienced, really, at medical school. It just didn't attract me. I was quite attracted by surgery, if I'm going to be fair. Um, but if I was going to reflect, at that time, I couldn't get any enthusiasm up for any of it, really. So when, it, when I uh, completed my house jobs, which, which was, what, F1, I think is what it's called now, was called back in that day. And I was talking to my mentor as a surgeon, and he said, what do you think of doing? And this is uh, over an nephrectomy, kidney removal. Um, I said, I'm not thinking of doing anything. Um, I said, uh, I, said I, I just can't get any enthusiasm out for anything. 
And his honest advice over a couple of conversations was, go then. No, not in a... We're still friends, by the way. <laughs> he just said, go. It, it, it's, you, you're going to get very frustrated if you're doing something that you don't enjoy. And then there's a lot of politics in medicine, and we've got hardly any autonomy left now. I remember this coming up in my interviews for medical school. This is 84. And I remember being asked um, um, in one of my interviews, what do you think about the fact that we doctors have um, increasingly less autonomy and are able to make fewer and fewer decisions about how we treat our patients? That's quite a big question in 1984. And I said something like, I don't quite see it like that. And the guy that asked me the question said, I'm not asking for your opinion on it. <laughs> I'm telling you it's happening, OK? And uh, what's your point of view on it? And it's, so, you know, so this has been going on a while where doctors have felt a bit sort of disenfranchised and they don't have autonomy. And, and these are a big problem anyway. I felt a bit like that. And, um, and so what I decided to do was take some time out. So to keep uh, body and soul together, I started to do some locums. And I, um, I started to do those, you know, contemplating my life and my navel mainly. And then what, I, uh, basically, what basically happened, a few months into this, I was uh, seeing some patients that were due for operations in the afternoon. So I was doing a surgical locum in a hospital up in a place called Newmarket, if anyone knows it. And uh, effectively what happened was I saw an elderly man uh, who, I think he was mid, uh, sorry, uh, early 70s, had never been in hospital before and had never been unwell. And he'd come in with an inguinal hernia from digging his allotment. And um, I just really, I liked him. And I'm quite an informal person, so I was chatting with him. And, um, and I said, well, you really never, you know, because w- when you clerk someone in, normally someone of that age, and it's, you know, you have to do ECGs and all sorts of stuff. And I didn't have to do anything with him. He was just perfect to go, basically. And uh, I actually, at that time, was suffering from a few health issues of my own. And some of you may have got into this area, partly through health is- issues. So uh, I put on quite a lot of uh, excess baggage over my time at medical school, eating a diet mainly based on things like kebabs, kebabs and Kentucky Fried Chicken, Cronenberg 1664. I wasn't very healthy, I'll just say that. I would also had uh, lifelong eczema, uh, although despite the fact that both my parents, uh, they're now retired, but were... Um, community paediatricians. No one had ever diagnosed that until I was halfway through medical school. (laughs) And then I went to... um, (laughs) I went to... uh, I was going to go to Thailand and I needed to get some jabs for it. And I went to the sort of, you know, the student GP surgery at UCL and uh, it turns out that the GP had been a dermatologist. And she said, right, take off your shirt, I'm going to give you these jabs. And she looked at my chest, and it was all under my arms. And sometimes my arm would actually stick to my, like, my chest, like it was so... And I think there was fungal involvement. And that was probably related, I realise now, to the fact that from about the age of 11 or 12, I used to self-administer, sort of prescribe antibiotics from under my parents' bed for my chronic tonsillitis. And I wonder I had some fungal involvement, if you understand. Anyway... So I was in a bit of a mess, but my, my most pressing problem from a health level was the fact that I felt rubbish a lot of the time, particularly in the afternoons. Um, and I had no idea what was causing this, but it got so bad that I remember you know, being taught, supposedly, in a clinic setting, you know, at UCH or somewhere, and you'd be sitting there, and then someone would say something like, look, if I'm going to teach you, you need to do some work, so can you get up and take that patient's blood pressure or something like that? And I'd be so tired, I'd actually want to say, although I didn't, I'd actually want to say, you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was knackered a lot of the time. And obviously, when you start working as a, as a doctor, and now your sleep is, you know, contracted for different reasons than it was when you are a student, basically, I felt terrible. Anyway, as a result of this, because of this patient, I said to him, whatever you're on, I'd like some of. Because, you know, I'm a third of his age, and he's got twice the well-being, and I just thought, you know, I need to do something about this. So I said it rather glibly, uh, but he took me sort of at face value, and he said, look... <clears throat> There's a, a, th- a few basic things uh, that I think are important. Now, this guy had been in the army, and I don't mean this at all in a disparaging way. He wasn't particularly sophisticated, you know what I mean, but he had very good ideas, and he said, look, physical exercise is important. That's why I cycle every day. My knees are slightly creaky, so I cycle. I do my... Uh, eat, grew organic vegetables. But he had a very good outlook on life, I felt. And what really clinched it for me um, was that he was visited the next day after his hernia operation by his wife, similar age, 
And she walked onto the ward, and he got up out of the bed, and I remember, probably the, the analgesics have worked off a little bit, you know, worn off. So he gets up, he goes over to her, gives her a big hug, okay, and I'm on the ward and I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, that's very nice, because it's actually quite warm. It's like a proper warm embrace, not a, you know, not a British one, a proper one. <laughs> and, um, and I... So he spotted me, because I'm on the other side of the ward, and he turned around, so his wife's there, and she can't really see me behind, but he's turned around, and then he went... Like that. <laughs> and um, I thought, right. <laughs> the other thing he was doing, uh, it was he, was he was taking supplements as well. Now, that, that was really unheard of then. Okay. Um, and basically, he'd been listening to a radio broadcast, and someone had been banging on about antioxidants. He thought, well, I'll try some of those. So anyway, um, that afternoon, after the operating list, I had to go into Newmarket Town to buy an iron, because the doctor's mess one had broken, and I like an iron shirt. And um, as I was, it was a sort of covered area, I remember, and I sort of went past, I think it was a Holland and Barrett, but outside there was like a carousel of books. And this conversation was still a little bit in my head, and I thought, I'm going to buy a book. I didn't have anything, because I was a locum, I didn't have any friends. So I thought, <laughs> I'll buy a book and I'll read that. And I started reading a book about Newton. I can't remember exactly what it was, but as I was reading it, I was thinking, I mean, this is actually very important. You know, this f made sense. It made more sense to me, honestly, in that couple of hours I was reading it than my six years of medical education, to be perfectly frank. And I thought, right, I'm going to start changing a few things. So I sort of had a hunch that maybe dairy was causing my eczema, so that sort of went for a while. And I also, I suppose, scaled my, back, my diet down to what now would be called paleo. It's basically a natural, unprocessed diet, so I took out a load of, excuse my language, crappy carbohydrates from my diet and started to eat some proper food for the first time in the whole of my life, basically. And so what happened uh, very quickly was, within a week, my eczema disappeared. I mean, it just absolutely went, went, disappeared. The itching went, just everything. So I felt a lot better about that. Um, and in about six weeks, I'd, I lost a substantial amount of weight without hunger. But also, within two weeks, I had all my energy back. So Ronga was talking about this earlier. And, um, you know, you feel great now. You probably feel better than you did maybe 20 years ago or something, do you know what I mean? It's not uncommon for that to happen. And so as a result of that, I was thinking, this is actually quite important. Now, it could be a massive placebo effect, but I don't know. So I think this is probably quite important, and I start reading more about it. And then I took a bit of a leap of faith, and I just started a practice, basically, doing this sort of work. And what I found very, very quickly is, exactly as Rongan said, I suddenly felt like I had some skills and some knowledge that, I, that could actually help people. And I was seeing people that had problems that I, I think as a conventionally minded doctor I had no clue about, and it didn't fit the description, and that's not a syndrome, and blah. And then suddenly I was thinking, well, this person's got a fundamental problem around blood sugar, this is food sensitivity here, this person's overgrown yeast, or whatever it was. I mean, it's quite simple. But, you know, these things are important because they're common. And so as a result of that, I basically ended up sort of specialising in the area of medicine before it really was an area of medicine, if that makes sense. I mean, it's a little bit fringe now, but uh, to be perfectly frank, back then, you know, t about 25 years ago, there was nothing in this area, basically, at all. So the education had to be a bit sort of ad hoc, and I sort of went over to the States a bit and did a course here and there, and sort of got my uh, education rather piecemeal. I don't um, in any way regret that, but now there are structures in place for people interested in this sort of medicine so that you don't have to do that and hop around the place because you can sort of enrol on something and get all of the information that you need. So over the years, basically, I've taken... Uh, I still prescribe a little bit, but very rarely, to be honest. Um, uh, so, I mean, even when I'm, for example, treating thyroid disease, you know, I don't really look at it like I was trained to and I don't really believe that... TSH is the sole arbiter of someone's thyroid status, like some endocrinologists might. I thought it was a bit rich, actually, that um, <laughs> when you were talking about uh, the headaches and um, there was that sort of controversy about the fact that, uh, you know, where's the evidence? And this probably came from a few neurologists. And I don't know what you know about neurology, <laughs> but generally it's useless. It's a sort of diagnostic speciality, generally. Elizabeth, is that... Is that fair enough? <laughs> we I, no, we didn't confer before on this. It's a sort of, it's quite diagnostic, so they come up with a long name for something, and they oh, well, that's very clever, and blah, blah, blah. And then they can do hardly anything about it, usually. It's the reality. Anyway, so let's move on uh, to talk uh, about uh, this. So, essentially, um, 
in medicine, we've got a bit obsessed with evidence-based medicine. You may have noticed, and that didn't exist actually when I qualified, and it came about in about the mid 19. 90s, and now everyone talks about it all of the time. Doctors absolutely believe, by the way, generally, conventionally minded doctors, that what they're doing is evidence-based, and what you might be doing or interested in doing is not evidence-based. So I'm interested to know, actually, whether medicine is evidence-based or not. And it's not easy to find out, but someone has bothered to actually look at this properly. And there's a, a journal called Clinical Evidence. It's a sort of offshoot of the British Medical Journal. And every so often, they review all the conventional medical therapies and see which ones have been subjected to proper trials, randomised controlled trials. And then they come up with a figure. This has been proven to be beneficial. This looks harmful. This stuff we don't know about. Anyway, does anyone here know, currently, what percentage of conventional medical approaches have been validated and shown to be positively beneficial? 35. 35, that's a good guess, but you're way too high. <laughs> it's about 10, it's actually 11%. It's this group here. Now, I don't think in the area that I work in it's any better, to be perfectly frank, because you know a lot of the approaches that we may take may be informed by some sort of science or research, but have they been rigorously tested in a sort of clinical setting? No is the answer. And the question is, does it matter? Because you could argue, basically, what is um, evidence-based medicine really all about? Well, this is one of the fathers of evidence-based medicine. Uh, he died a couple of years ago, Professor David Sackett. And if you read this, his, this description, basically, that he has of evidence-based medicine, you'll notice here that the first thing that he mentions, really, is this. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise and then goes on with the best available external clin clinical evidence. And then he goes on also to say here that basically clinical expertise means the proficiency and judgment that individual clinicians acquire through clinical experience and clinical practice. Okay? Now this is, I think, really, really important because if I sort of reflect on my practice and I'm really honest about it, I think probably a tiny fraction of what I do in clinical practice <coughs> Uh, has been validated in a way that some doctors would view as appropriate and necessary. But most people in clinical practice are not practicing medicine that has been shown to be beneficial in trials, but they have been found works very well in practice. This is important. So, for example, Rongan said earlier, there's someone having 90 headaches a week, and now she has two a week. Okay? That's the sort of evidence that we would tend to find quite useful. And then you've got a bunch of neurologists going, not interested. I remember having a sort of semi-argument with a neurologist at a party once. And um, it was very interesting, actually, because he was quite normal to begin with, OK? <laughs> and then when we got onto the subject of medicine, he went very professorial. He went, mm, he's, mm, everything changed. His, his mood, his, his accent, everything changed, OK? And we, we were talking about migraine, I don't know, I mean, obviously I'm a huge wow at parties talking about migraine, but anyway. So he's, we, we somehow got talking about migraine. And uh, it's, not a, it's really not a condition, as Ronga knows, and many of you will know, that's particularly well dealt with in conventional medicine. And I said, well, there's probably approaches, this is years ago now, about 20 years ago, I said, look, there's probably approaches that you could take that might help your patients, actually. And he said, mm, like what? And I said, um, <coughs> magnesium, for example. Uh, and he said, well, what's the purported mechanism of that? And I actually think I do know maybe what's going on there, but I didn't want to sort of rise to that particular boat. So I said, I don't know, and why does it matter? You know, it's safe, and it appears to work. And he said, well, how could you possibly use something if you don't even know the mechanism? It, this, I'm thinking, what is this? Are you actually interested in helping your patients, or do you want to score some intellectual points? Do you see what I mean? And that's one of the problems that we have in medicine generally. It's a bit sort of intellectual, not necessarily focused on the patient. Now, here's another little um, thing that I found. This is in the British Medical Journal. This came from an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, and there'd been some sort of uh, articles on evidence-based medicine. And basically, he's saying this, you know, if I smack my thumb with a mallet, you know, it hurts. How many times do I have to do that before it's sort of evidence-based, okay? Uh, it's really two fingers up, I think, to the evidence-based medicine crowd that believes that it all has to be ratified. And the other thing I liked about this, okay, this is a typical orthopaedic surgeon, you have to declare competing interests. These are his. Uh, I like hammers and power tools. <laughs> He's just like... 
<laughs> you lot. Anyway, I've got a lot of time for orthopaedic surgeons because one thing I've noticed clinically is it generally works. Not always, but it's generally a good thing. If someone's got a completely degenerative hip and nothing's really helping and they have that replaced and they have a whole new lease of life for 10 or 15 years, I would say that's a big success. And that's very distinct, by the way, from many aspects of medicine, including neurology. Endocrinology is another one that I've got a bit of a bugbear about, but let's not get into that <laughs> right now. So uh, here's my conclusion, really. I think medicine is more art than science, if I'm going to be frank. Um, there is a scientific element to it, and we can draw on whatever research, even in the lab, that's available. But ultimately, it's about practice. And that practice is really art-based, I think. And I think one of the important things is this, is that if you really want to be effective as a practitioner, um, you have to have good relationships with the people that you're seeking to help. It's, it's a really key thing. And this, I don't know about any of the other doctors in the room, but we were not told anything about this at medical school. Nothing about how to approach patients, how to talk to them, how to get the best out of that situation. Did anyone here have any... I realised that I was sort of, you know, trained back in the ARC days, but did, did anyone here, maybe training more recently, have any of that, did you? Not recently, but okay. I was a bit did you have any? Yeah, I did at St Thomas. Okay, fantastic. What did they teach you? Oh, really? Oh, I missed that memo. Okay, that's good. That's really good. That's like, anyone else? You did? Okay, you're quite young. You know, I don't want to patronise you, but, you know, that's really good. It's great that you did. Okay, so here's a few things that I think that are important. First of all, um, when I think about patients, you know, obviously we're there to serve. It's a service industry, health and medicine. It really is. You're trying to serve their needs on some level. Uh, but, but actually, you get something out of it as well. So when I think about what I know, right, yeah, some of it I've been on courses and whatever, but actually what I know is essentially what my patients have told me over the years. That's really what I know. You know, what works, what doesn't work has come from basically experimenting on people and seeing what sticks and what doesn't. And so every interaction that you have with a patient is, is a two-way process, right? They get something out of it, we hope. You also get something out of it. But to make that as productive as possible for both parties, okay, we need a good relationship. So one thing that I would suggest here that's quite useful in practice is, that, and I feel like I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs here, but this is important, a bit of humility goes a long way. So don't assume any position of superiority in any way, shape or form, I would say, intellectually or anything. Just be human about it. Um, now, I read uh, an article that uh, Jeremy Hawke at um, Nutrilink sent me, and it was written by Mike Ash, who's sitting there. And it, basically the title was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was something like, are we too judgmental to be good practitioners or something like that. Was that right? This is a really good article because some of us, you know, can be a bit judgmental about our patients or clients, whatever it is, how they look, how they speak, you know, the, the supposedly poor choices they've made. That's really got to go. Even if you don't say, what did you do that for? or Why are you doing this or whatever? It can leak out of you, okay? And it's not a good, you know, they, they need... They need to feel that they're being respected, of course, okay, and heard, and it doesn't help if we're judging. And so, you know that professorial mode that I told you about, which neurologists do all the time with their bow ties and... <laughs> oh, bleh, don't get me started. Uh, that, you know, like that's going to give them a personality or something, anyway. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a novelty tie, but anyway. So... Um, so that also, it's a huge turn-off for people, okay? So just talk to them like you talk to a friend, is my advice. Um, and also, however much you know, <laughs> resist the urge to sort of overcomplicate things and sort of demonstrate your expertise and intellect, OK? Because none of that's important to people, really. And it, it usually just brings up barriers. And with regard to that, be careful with language. Because one thing at medical school, I notice this a lot, you know, we sort of develop a language and it's completely incomprehensible and gobbledygook. And even some doctors don't understand it that well, OK? And all of that basically has to go. So one of the things that I think about when I'm explaining things to patients and talking to them, I, it's almost like I'm talking to, and this is not to patronise them, I'm talking to a child, OK? The vocabulary might be slightly different, but I'm actually assuming no knowledge whatsoever. Now, even if they know that, that's fine. They're thinking, I already know this, that's OK. But don't assume any knowledge and don't be too technical and also be brutally honest. So one of the things that we doctors can do uh, and we have a bit of a problem with sometimes is admitting that we don't know something, OK? We struggle with this a lot. Because, you know, we go through an educational system where if you're in a clinical examination, you don't know something, it's painful. And you don't want to say, I don't know. So we were often advised, I don't know what happened to other doctors here, to at least guess. 
Well, that's not going to work here, generally. I don't advise guessing. So I found this works very well because when an individual comes in and they say something like, like I had in my medical finals, by the way, in the obstetric case, the lady said, I've got protein C deficiency. They wheel her out every year, I suppose. I had no idea what it was, never heard of it. And so I didn't bluff it. I just said, I've heard of a few things. I've never heard of that. Can you tell me about it? What do you know about it? And these days now, in practice, when I don't really know what someone is talking about, I will say to them something like, have you Googled this? What did you find out about it? Is there an autoimmune component, is it thought? But, you know, and then they can give you that information. And part of that really means encouraging them to express themselves fully, right? So that, you know, you're, you really want to be in a position where you're embracing their ideas and their preferences. This is what evidence-based medicine is about, by the way. This is even in the Dreadful Medical Council Good Practice Guide, that we should be respecting patients' preferences, okay? So there's a few sort of sentences. I don't rehearse these, okay? But these are the sort of things that I'll say during a consultation that I find really help people to open up and feel properly heard. So very often I'll say, look, I've got some boring stuff to do. I need to get your name and address and stuff like that. And then after that, you're going to tell me why you're here, okay? Now, for quite a long part of this consultation, you are going to be doing most of the talking, okay? I'll interrupt you maybe, I'll ask for clarification, but you're going to be the, doing the talking. Okay? What I'm signalling to them is, this is their time to be heard, and I'm all ears. Okay? I don't say it in those words, but this is what that's saying. Here's another thing that I do a lot. Even if I have a fairly good idea, I think, of what's going on, and particularly if I don't, because that can happen, I ask them what they think is going on. Now, about eight times out of ten, I think, someone has a pretty good idea of what's going on, and in those situations, about nine and a half times out of ten, they're right. Because usually, you know, people have quite an innate sense, well, the people that I might see in practice, probably the same for you, they have an innate sense of what's going on, and these days, they may well have Googled it and looked at the symptoms or whatever, and arrived at the diagnosis, or they might have an idea of what it is. So they say something like, I think it's something to do with my hormones, OK? Well, it probably is, is the reality. If they have that strong sense and they've Googled it a bit, then you're pro that's gold. Now, what's happened um, more latterly, I think, in medicine is, you know, uh, you know I grew up in, in an era, and I was talking to someone at dinner last night. I was actually abroad, but anyway, I was at dinner. Completely random guy. And uh, his parents are doctors. Um, and his father, who's 79, still practices as a GP three days a week. And he was saying that he basically he's a very good, he regards his father as a very good diagnostician. And I said, you know what, your father probably trained and grew up in a time, basically, when uh, there weren't that many tests available. And if you don't have your wits about you and really listen to people and look at them and examine them properly, you can't make a diagnosis. So he's probably what I would call old school, and this is a very good thing. So one adjunct to that is really to ask people what the diagnosis is, essentially, because very often they'll tell you. Um, Here's another thing that I'll very often uh, ask is, you know, what is it that you're most concerned with? Because they might give you a list of 15 or 20 things that can easily happen. I've got itchy toes and my hair's falling out and whatever. And then, you know, don't make any assumptions. It's not necessarily the first thing that they said that uh, is really bothering them. So just say, what is it that's really bothering you? And then you've got a, a, a more useful starting point. And then this uh, question I ask almost every time, because I'll often give people a range of things that they might do to address their issues, and then I'll get them to choose what they want to do. And it might be all of it or some of it, occasionally none of it, but that doesn't really happen. You know, it's up to them. They're making the decision. You're just facilitating that. And I find that a very useful que uh, question to ask. Uh, two other things just to have in mind here, I think. There's two questions that I have at the back of my mind when I see any patient, OK? One is this. I know it's obvious. What's the best thing for this person? What do I think is going to work the best? What's going to marry with their ideals and preferences? OK, that's what I'm thinking. And the other thing I'm thinking is this. Um, how would this be explained properly? Okay, Because one thing that I've noticed about people is they tend to make quite emotional decisions, but it has to make sense, or it tends to be rejected. Okay, So I spend a lot of time in practice, because sometimes people say, how do you treat patients? I don't treat patients. I'm essentially telling them how to treat themselves, Okay, which is what functional medicine is br broadly about. And so I'll, ex I'll do my best to explain it in a way that makes absolute sense. I'll ask them, do you have any questions about that? No, don't have any questions. And you've got a pretty good idea that they're going to be quite, and I don't mean this in a patronising way, compliant, that they're likely to go and do it because they feel it's the right thing, they believe in it. And the other thing about this explaining it is it's quite useful sometimes to explain your approach to other people. Like if you write to their doctor, you need to make a case very often, okay? 
Uh, one thing I've also found useful on doctor's letters, by the way, is uh, having this last sentence. If you haven't, so I try and explain things properly, but I appreciate not everyone's going to be receptive to it. But I say at the bottom, if you have any questions at all about this patient and his or her management, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much for listening. John, thank you so much. I thought it was incredible. And I think no matter what our discipline is, I think we can all learn a lot from uh, some of the insights that you shared with us. And yeah, thank you very much for that. So look, guys, it's now time for the panel past the evening. Um, any of you who've got some desperate last minute questions to ask, please do use the hashtag functional forum on Twitter. But I'd like to invite all three speakers to the stage. But also we've got um, someone who I alluded to before, a special guest for our panel this evening. Uh, she is a doctor who I think qualified for medical school oh, just over a year ago. Yeah. yeah, so a new breed uh, of younger doctors. She is an author and she's a social media influencer. She goes by the name of the food medic. It's Dr. Hazel Wallace. So round of applause for Hazel. So, uh, a few questions are coming. I'm just going to start this off um, and ask Hazel a couple of questions, that's all right. Um, and, the, and the first one is really, what prompted you to start your Instagram? Uh, and what have been the challenges that you have faced along the way? Um, first of all, thank you for having me here tonight. It's a, it's a real honour. Um, I was at the last functional forum and I really enjoyed it. Um, so, I initially got into... I guess looking at lifestyle medicine, um, when I was doing my first degree in medical sciences just over five years ago now, um, and I found myself in a very similar position to um, everyone else who joins me on this panel where my health, I guess, was compromised by my lifestyle. So I was studying quite a lot, um, working really hard, but not really eating very well um, or exercising. and. I got myself into the position where I was on a lot of medication antibiotics for acne, um, on a lot of inhalers for my asthma, um, and I just found out that I was getting into, I was going to be starting postgraduate medicine, so kind of had a long, hard look at myself and decided I didn't want to be a doctor who wasn't healthy or didn't feel healthy, didn't look healthy. Um, so I kind of took it upon myself to use myself, I guess, as a guinea pig and change my diet and change my lifestyle. I started going to the gym um, and researching a lot about nutrition because what I found, and I'm sure that lots of you will agree who've been through medical school, is you don't really learn much about nutrition. Um, and I found that very disappointing, um, personally. So I really got into it then, and I started Instagram um, five years ago now as a personal I guess a personal journal to um, help me be, be inspired and motivated to, to keep going on my path and my journey and keep doing what I was doing. And I had it private initially. Um, I got some, you know, I guess my peers didn't really understand what I was doing or thought I was a bit weird to be into something else outside of clinical evidence-based medicine. Um, and from there, I just grew my platform. I started a website where I was sharing information on nutrition and how what we eat and the way we live our lives affects our health. Um, and I carried that out through a medical school. Um, I wrote my book in my final year of medicine. I also trained to be a personal trainer um, because I was very, very interested in exercise and, and the benefits that it offers us. And then I moved to London and started working as a junior doctor here um, and continued um, everything I was doing as part of the food medic and have continued to do so still. So this year now I'm locoming um, to give myself a bit more time to focus on things outside of medicine um, and outside of the hospital, but also so I can look at the other approaches to medicine and expand my clinical practice. And it's not that I'm moving out of mainstream medicine. I'm very much, very much passionate about working um, in and for, for the NHS, but I'm also, I also know that there's a lot more that we can be doing. And I think because I'm very early in my career um, and still enthusiastic, um, I'm, I'm, keen, I'm keen to kind of, I guess, 
grab the bull by the horns um, while I can. And that's, that's really my story. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I mean, interesting. So you did your sort of, sort of my time, we called it a house officer year. You're doing yeah. your, uh, your first year as a foundation doctor. Um, many of us, I guess, feel that these principles are very much applicable to chronic health conditions. And I'm interested to know the, the sort of things that you've been blogging about and writing about. Uh, have you seen relevance for them in your first year in, in hospital, the patients that have been coming through? Has it been relevant in that setting? It's been difficult in that setting sure. um, because my you know the rotations that you go through are very much general medicine or uh, general surgery so in general medicine there'll be uh, usually patients who have chronic diseases that i guess they'll have multiple comorbidities and they're there in hospital for an acute problem whether it's pneumonia sure. or appendicitis and it's difficult to kind of untangle all of these comorbidities in yeah for whilst they're in I guess secondary care um, and I think for lots of doctors and myself included you kind of think that's up to the GP um, to deal with it's interesting, and, yeah. and you, you think oh someone else will deal with that you know I, I think that that sort of highlights a, w one of the, the slides that, that you put up about this it's become so specialist so so I would I would call it overly specialized the way we look at patients whether we're talking about in terms of specialities or how we look at um, different parts of the body as different organs, and it's, you know, it's not a heart problem, it's a chest problem, it's not a chest problem, it's an yeah. abdo problem. And um, yeah, I can, I can resonate with that. So I guess, I'm, I'm guessing, because it's taken me you know, a while to, into my career to, to really have the confidence to go and actually speak it as I see it, because I think there's a lot of fear with many uh, younger professionals. I think we've, many of us in the room have probably felt that at various times on our journey. Um, even if fear to say, John, what you covered, which is, I don't know, to a patient. And I've, I've always found it actually quite easy to do that. And I found it one of the best things you can do is when you don't know, you just tell them, actually, I don't know. Um, and, and as a GP, I used to say, um, early on, I used to say, look, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, kind of give you a review in two weeks. And, let me do a bit of digging and see if I can find out a bit more about that for you. Uh, and I think we shouldn't be scared to say that. Um, the, the one thing I, I just want to finish off with you, Hazel, if possible, is with your influence on social media, it's been quite clear to me, and it's really exciting for me, and we've got people at various different stages of their career in the room tonight and on, and on the panel, that there is a growing movement, certainly amongst doctors, uh, of the term lifestyle medicine. Yeah. And I often wonder, is that a more palatable term, do you think, than functional medicine? And you know, what, what do you regard as lifestyle medicine? If that's, is that a question you're sort of happy to elaborate on? Yeah, I think, I, I, I definitely think it is, um, a lot more people are more comfortable with using that term because it doesn't seem as far disconnected from, I guess, conventional medicine. Sure. Um, and maybe it is, maybe they are two separate entities, you know, functional medicine may be at one end of the spectrum, lifestyle medicine may be somewhere in between that conventional medicine. Um, and I think a lot more doctors, I guess, who are maybe at my level of training, and I particularly see it at GP level, and also medical students are... I guess we're coming through during the health and fitness era, you know, it's currently very trendy to look after yourself and look after your health. And I think the doctors that are coming through in this phase are definitely more open-minded to different approaches to health. You know, people are meditating now, practicing mindfulness, whereas 10 years ago that would have been considered very hippy-dippy and That's very true. unusual to do. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And then, uh, Abena, I'd sort of say you've, with your work with Medic Footprints, um, have you seen common themes come up, you know, certain obstacles that, that healthcare professionals are finding in terms of, um, you know, embracing uh, lifestyle medicine or functional medicine or the frustrations within their career? And obviously you're trying to facilitate them thinking outside the box. Um, is there anything that you're seeing that you think can speed up this process? That's an interesting question. I mean, I'm quite new to functional medicine and I, I, I guess I found it as a result of my own personal journey and interests. Um, I don't 
from my personal circles, I don't know many doctors who know of functional medicine or lifestyle medicine. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I've, you know, this is, this is one of the things we're featuring at the event that we're holding because there is a lack of awareness. Um, I mean, I, I can't really speak for kind of the more junior doctors, mm. but especially people that in, in my era that, that they just don't know it even exists. Um, so I, I think it is about lack of awareness. As I mentioned in, in my talk, um, if we're not exposed to these things and we just don't know about these things and we don't know they even exist. And I think that's probably one of the biggest obstacles. It is about exposure. Um, but, you know, after the Wellness Medics, uh, we, had, we had an event a couple of weeks ago that, that Hazel ran, which is on the, the, the London rooftop gym and involved about an hour of HIIT training <laughs> and then eating really healthy food. And I, I had the best time of my life. And um, Rupi actually took a video and I posted it on uh, Facebook. And there were so many people that messaged me and, you know, I got loads of, you probably got loads of interest yeah. as well. And they were like, where can we join? Where can we sign up? So there's definitely interest there. It's definitely something that's going to be really popular, but it is about just raising awareness um, amongst the wider community. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. I think there is a growing awareness. I think um, <laughs> social media, I think, is allowing a lot of people to access information. Um, if we go on in the terminology, I, I, I think it's always been an issue. You know, uh, what do you call things? Because by definition, if you're doing something different, it has to have a name. Um, but... Genuinely speaking, I don't think anything that is talked about in this forum or within the, the education or functional medicine, I, I simply, I think it's just good quality medicine that fulfills all the criteria that we were taught about. The problem is the practice of medicine today has moved away from the principles. And, you know, it's interesting, your last slide, John, actually about um, asking the patient what they think is wrong or you know, what they should be doing or what resonates with them. I'm pretty sure, certainly when I was training as a GP, that was a big part of, you know, what we should be doing. Problem is, is you go into 10 minutes and you, you've got 40 patients to see in a day and these things get compressed and it becomes very didactic. And I think that's where the problem is. So actually, I genuinely believe that once people understand what the concepts of lifestyle medicine, functional medicine, progressive medicine, whatever you want to call these things, I, don't, I actually think that, you know, any, anyone who's been on a functional medicine course, I, I think I can pretty much safely say, or any doctor I've taught about these principles, they basically say, once you get it, you can't go back. Once you know it, you cannot unknow it. Uh, John very kindly shared his own personal experiences and you, you'll, you'll still have today going to see a dermatologist and they'll say that the skin has nothing to do with your diet. <laughs> now frankly, I'm, again, I wouldn't have said this two years ago, but either our profession needs to update itself and move with the times and understand and embrace the fact that people are empowering themselves and trying things which are working, or we will end up becoming redundant. Because social media, what it's doing also is it's allowing information to be not the preserve of institutions anymore. People are getting their own information and trying things themselves. Um, John, you've been practicing for 27 years. How do you see, do, do you see something out there that is shifting and that is changing? Yeah, no, I'm really, I'm very optimistic. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things. There, there is increasing, I think, interest in the health professionals, but you know, with the, with the public generally, um, I think generally we're pushing on an open door. There's a need for it, there's a desire for it. People get it, they understand it generally, not everyone. But that I think will just grow and grow. And you're absolutely right what you say about um, sort of health information medicine not being um, just really in the hands of doctors, for example, because, you know, I don't know, 25 years ago, you had to take your doctor's opinion and maybe get a second opinion, but that's it, that's your lot now everything's changed so people are much more empowered they're much more sophisticated uh, there's been a sort of democratization of health information and i think it's been fantastic and uh, you know I, i'm hugely optimistic about the future and uh, you're right i think what you say about doctors they're going to end up basically some of them i think uh, are just not going to really get with the program and as a result of that um, they're going to find themselves broadly redundant i think it, i think that is genuinely going to happen um, so I think it's all good, really. 
Yeah. Um, well, well, one thing, John, I was just going to touch yeah. on. I shared you with you some of the insights into the story with the lady uh, on Doctor in the House with, with um, uh, these cluster headaches that were diagnosed by her neurologist. And I just thought back to a conversation when I was talking to this uh, professor of neurology in Oxford, and we were, you know, you have to, you know, check with a neurologist. Frankly, I felt very well equipped to manage this problem because although it was symptoms in her head, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what was going on in her body and I thought, felt very equipped, but you know, spoke to him, got an opinion. And what was interesting is trying to tease out the right diagnosis, right? Saying, okay, she's got, she's got criteria for cluster headaches. She's got certain things that suggest atypical migraines. She's got certain things that are suggesting paroxysmal hemicrania. I think on balance, I think it's cluster headaches, as her previous neurologist has said it is. And I said, Prof, can I just ask you, why does it matter what Absolutely. she has? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and this is because he's a me. neurologist, that's why it matters. No, but he was great. <laughs> but he, was, he was great, John. What he said, actually, you know what? These things don't matter. They're just purely for research purposes. They allow us to have a homogenous group of patients, and we can trial out... Uh, a therapy within that, but but wrong and she's a real life patient Fantastic. and she doesn't neatly fit into any of these categories and that is the point. The textbooks are one thing, but then you've got real life patients. And Elizabeth, I'm I, you, I'm intrigued to hear the journey that your your brother goes on <laughs> over the next few years, particularly with his sister being such a keen uh, and vocal proponent for a different way of doing medicine. So. I'm, it's I'm, very interesting discussions, but I think I'd just like to raise the point, though, as well, like you're saying about labels and chasing labels. And, you know, I'll say it again, it's the fear factor. And, you know, I see so many patients come to me that, you know, don't have a firm diagnosis or a label, and they are so scared because things are going wrong and they don't know how to fix it. And we mustn't underestimate <laughs> that factor. And so... Yes, neurologists, where do I start? <laughs> but, you know, just trying to label something and then sending people on their way is, is not the answer. So, so yeah, a, a much more integrated approach. <laughs> well, guys, I think we're, we're sort of running slightly over time for our, um, our live YouTube audience. And I'm, I was meant to put on the music pre-panel, so uh, I don't know, James, what you have actually put on this. So let's see what the, the pre-panel music was meant to be. <laughs> Can I kick it? Can I kick it? Can I kick it? Just noise. Just noise. Just the voice. <laughs> Look, guys, thank you very much for everyone who attended in, in person tonight. Uh, thank you for everyone who's watching. Please, this is just a little reminder to say the whole idea of these is if you cannot attend here and we have limited space here, it's about trying to set up meetups in your own area, whether it's in the UK, whether it's around the world. There are over 500 already. Go to the website, meetup.functionalforum.com. You'll get lots of resources. I know people who've set them up uh, around the UK and they're growing communities. It's a really great way of actually engaging people in your local community. Um, I feel slightly uncomfortable trying to <laughs> do this. But uh, I'll quickly say, I, I basically try to distill uh, the things that I've learned over my 16 years and through filming Doctor in the House uh, and sort of educating and teaching doctors, I've tried to put all in a book that's really designed for the public because I'm about helping people. And um, as John put it, it's not about putting your brain out there uh, to show people how much you know. It's about trying to come up with tools that are going to help people. Um, I think my own work-life balance <laughs> will be uh, shortly a lot better once, once this is sort of completed and, and finished. But, you know, I, I, I very much hope that it, it helps a lot of people. I'm also hoping a lot of the profession read it and use it as tools to help their patients, uh, but also to help themselves look after, you know, look after themselves. The AFMCP course, the Applying Functional Medicine and Clinical Practice course, which... I'm not over-egging it to say it was probably the most life-changing course I've been on in my 16-year career. And so I would highly recommend anyone who, if you, who are interested in these sort of concepts and have not done this, it is brilliant. I had to go to America to do it. It's now gaining in such popularity that it's pretty much going to start running every year in the UK. 
Um, it's already over half sold out and it's still over 12 months to go. This movement is growing. So guys, if you are interested, I'd go to afmcp-uk.org and book onto the course. Uh, many last time didn't and it was sold out by the time they wanted to. So it's just, it's just worth thinking about. And um, 